Hey, good afternoon to you. It's 5.07 News Talk 105.9 WMAL, where we're making sense of the news. You can join us today, 888-630-9625, 888-630-WMAL. CBS barely wasted any time at all before they got into the issue of abortion, or as they call it, reproductive rights, which is a euphemism for destroying life, actually. And they wanted to talk to J.D. Vance about it. They said, this is your great polling weakness, so let's see if we can hurt you. Here's how some of that went. Tim Walls last night. Let me tell you about this idea that there's diverse states. There's a young woman named Amber Thurman. She happened to be in Georgia, a restrictive state. Because of that, she had to travel a long distance to North Carolina to try and get her care. Amber Thurman died in that journey back and forth. The fact of the matter is, how can we as a nation say that your life and your rights, as basic as the right to control your own body, is determined on geography? There's a very real chance, had Amber Thurman lived in Minnesota, she would be alive today. That's Tim Wall saying that abortion laws should not be left to the voters of the United States. For more on this, I want to bring in Sean Carney now, president and CEO of 40 Days for Life, who was watching all of it closely. Hello, Sean. Good to have you with us. Uh, it's good to be on. Thanks for having me. So, so uh, Tim Walls invoked the name Amber Thurman last night. And as I understand it, Thurman died a couple years ago. It was 2022. Uh, she had taken an abortion pill, which led to uh, fatal consequences for her. Isn't that right? Yeah, she took an abortion. It's the opposite of what he said. The abortion pill killed her. Uh, and this is the problem with the deregulation of, of abortion pills that the left wants to do. She had a very common complication, which is the first pill, it's two pills. The first pill poisons the baby, and then the second pill induces the woman into labor, and she delivers the baby, passes the baby, usually in the toilet of her own apartment. And some of the baby was still inside of her, so she got an infection, and she waited uh, to go to the ER, and her baby was already dead. Um, I want to be clear on that. And when she went to the ER, um, she had complications, and she died. Uh, in no state is it illegal. It's absurd. Is it illegal to um, give care to her in that circumstance? By the way, this happens all the time. This is just that the women don't die. They usually go in sooner. And so 25 percent of women that, that take the, the abortion pills end up in the ER. It's one of the major problems the, uh, with it. Um, so it's very common, but they usually get in there and they can get care, and that's legal in all 50 states. This is a new fad that the Democrats are basically saying that we're making you know, miscarriage uh, the same as an abortion because it's the same – you know, a procedure uh, to remove a baby who miscarried. And so uh, this completely took everything out of context and, and uh, access to abortion would not have saved her life. And these are people that exploit 14 year old rape victims so they can sell abortion. So I guess we shouldn't be surprised that they're, they're using poor Amber to say, if you were in Minnesota, you'd be alive today. It's complete nonsense. Yes. And, and they use the exceptions to define the rule. But if you were to ask them, Hey, would you, okay, would, if, if I were to say, that abortion is uh, perfectly fine in those limited circumstances, uh, rape or incest, the life of the mother, would you be okay with out, outlawing it for convenience, like just the, uh, disposing of babies? Would you be okay with that? They would never say yes to that. They would never agree to that because the point is the, is the, is the larger category. Uh, it's just a matter of, of convenience and, and optional abortions. That's what the left is defending here. It is, and, and I, thought, I thought Vance overall kind of botched it, I guess, pun intended. A lot of his, his first three or four things he said were terrible on abortion, and then he hit a grand slam by finally calling Waltz out for uh, under him. Minnesota did have abortion through all 40 weeks, and there were eight babies who survived an abortion and died. When Waltz was governor, he removed the requirement to yeah. report those deaths from babies that survived an abortion. So it's not that he's for it. He doesn't even want to report it. No. I mean, he's a nut. And so it, it really I thought Vance did a good job of calling him out. on. That. I was uh, I, yeah, I was hoping I, I said earlier in the program, I was kind of hoping that he would get to that earlier in the abortion sequence because yeah. it's such uh, it's such an important thing for the voters to know. But J.D. Vance did, as you point out, uh, he did get there, Sean Carney. Here's what that sounded like as he called out Tim Walls. You're, you're free to disagree with me on this and explain this to me. But as I read the Minnesota law that you signed into into into, into law, the statute that you signed into law, it says that a doctor 
who presides over an abortion where the baby survives. The doctor is under no obligation to provide life-saving care to a baby who survives a botched late-term abortion. That is, I think, that's whether you're true. pro-choice or pro-abortion, that is fundamentally barbaric. And that's why I use that word, Nora, is because some of what we've seen, do you want to force Catholic hospitals to perform abortions against their will? Because Kamala Harris has supported suing Catholic nuns uh, to violate their freedom of conscience. We can be a big and diverse country where we respect people's freedom of conscience and make the country more pro-baby and pro-family, but please. Yes, Go Governor, please respond. Look, this is one where there's always something there. This is a very simple proposition. These are women's decisions to make about their health care decisions and the physicians who know best when they need to do this. Trying to distort the way a law is written to try and make a point. That's not it but at what all. What was I wrong this about, was, Governor? I, look, please tell me, what was that, I wrong about? That is about? not the way the law is written. Look, I, I've given but this- But how? I've given this advice on a lot of things that getting involved, getting against, that's been misread and it was fact-checked at the last debate. But the point on this is, is there's a continuation of these guys to try and tell women or to get involved. I use this line on this, just mind your own business on this. Things work best when Roe versus Wade was in place. When we do a restoration of Roe, that works best. That doesn't preclude us from in increasing funding for children. It doesn't increase us from making sure that once that child's born, like in Minnesota, they get meals, they get early childhood education, they get health care. So the hiding behind we're going to do all these other things when you're not proposing them in your budget, Kamala Harris is proposing them. She's proposing all those things to make life easier for families. I asked a specific question, Governor. You gave me a slogan as a response. It's not the case. It's not true. That's not what the law says. So they fact-checked it with President Trump. All right, so let me just bring you up to speed on how the media is handling that exchange. The New York Times today is – they published a fact check, and they accused J.D. Vance of lying. They say – they quoted J.D. Vance in the debate, and they said false. And then their explanation go, goes like this. Vance distorted Walls' repeal of a so-called Born Alive law that had been in effect in Minnesota since the 1970s. That law required doctors to report when a live child was born as the result of an abortion. And to provide, quote, all reasonable measures consistent with good medical practice to care for that infant. OK, Walls repealed it, didn't he, Sean Carney? In other words, what J.D. Vance said was true. It Well, it was already in place. It was already repealed when he became governor. What he did is got rid of the requirement. He didn't get rid of the, the practice by any means, but he got rid of the requirement to, to report it to the state. And and there's so many ways. I mean, you can go, but what's wrong with that? I mean, why 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 should we give care to those babies after a botched abortion? What do you think of that? I mean, and he did get in. You know, when do you do you believe in abortion at 40 weeks? Which they they all do. He was saying no, no, no. And I would ask him why not. I mean, if abortion's health care, if you need it at 40 weeks, why would you deny woman access to reproductive health? Yeah. So you know. I, there's so many ways to ask them, when, when will you sleep at night, Tim Waltz, and an abortion go on? Is it to 12 weeks? Is it 40 weeks? Is it 32 weeks? You know, and why? And so I, I just – I think that the you – know, the other thing – and we, I live in Texas. We have Governor Abbott. We had the heartbeat bill, and then once Roe was overturned, we banned abortion altogether. And these governors like Kemp and DeSantis and, and Abbott are so good at owning this and going on offense and saying – Look, we provide $165 million of our surplus to single moms who choose life for their babies. We're supporting the women. You're just selling abortions, and, and those are bipartisan things. North Carolina has it. Alabama yeah. has it. Yeah. You know, you're not going to get a Democrat in the world to deny uh, funding for that. Yeah, and also I, I do think that Republicans would do well to point out the very corrupt relationship that the left has with huge corporations – who are uh, pushing abortion merely to keep women chained to their desks rather than have them go on maternity oh, yeah. leave or raise a family. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a very disgusting relationship uh, that the left has with its donors uh, that the, the right should be calling out on a frequent basis. Um, the, uh, also, what came up last night, Tim Walls um, just made something up, which the, his campaign has been inventing. Uh, they say that uh, the Trump campaign policy is something called Project 2025. It's not. Uh, and they also said that Donald Trump will have a pregnancy registry. He will be tracking women's pregnancies all across the country. Listen to Tim Wall say this. So in Minnesota, what we did was restore Roe versus Wade. We made sure that we put women in charge of their health care. But look, this is not where if you don't know Amanda or a Hadley, you soon will. 
their project 2025 is going to have a registry of pregnancies. It's going to make it more difficult, if not impossible, to get contraception and limit access, if not eliminate access to infertility treatments. The the man uh, who wrote that section of Project 2025, which is a uh, Heritage Foundation conservative organization, just basically just a uh, policy proposals that they'd like any administration to pick up, including if Kamala Harris were to win, they'd be absolutely thrilled if she were to pick up some of these policy proposals. Roger Severino wrote the following on X last night. He says, Walls outrageously claims that the Project 2025 section I wrote would create a, quote, pregnancy registry. It merely recommends that the CDC compile anonymous abortion statistics for all 50 states and instead of the current 46 or 47 Walls' own state collects miscarriage information every year. So it runs a (laughs) miscarriage registry, according to this logic. It's so hypocritical. It's so dishonest. And it does strike me that it it is completely dishonest, Sean Carney. It's just being made up and then being told to the American people. It is. And I think the, the, the plan is that if you ask Kamala or Tim Waltz what their favorite color is or their favorite baseball team, they'll say, Project 2025. It's just their response to everything. And so uh, I think everybody was looking around. I mean, you could be a Democrat and you're kind of looking around going, I don't know, man, that doesn't sound right. <laughs> They're going to register. We're going to put the chip in you. It's going to be like Terminator 2. You know, it, did you get pregnant? Here's your chip. It's just so absurd. And they don't have anything else to run on. And, and I think this is part of the risk that you take when you say abortion is our number one issue. Yeah. Number one, it's, it's depressing at best, even for those who support it. People don't want to talk about abortion all day, and frankly, in American politics, it always comes down to the economy, to health care, to immigration, yes. to national defense, and and that's – it's a risk that their, that their campaign is taking. But yeah, and by the way, it's not Donald Trump and Republicans who are compiling registries of Americans. It's the left that wants to track whether or not you have a gun, what room or closet – Uh, You keep it in. It's the left that's trying to track your expenditures so that they can debank you. It's the left that's constantly trying to keep registries on American citizens to keep them at heel, Uh, not the right. And, of course, once again, I was 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 waiting for Vance to go. No, that was you with the vaccine. You're the registry guy, not me. That's exactly (laughs) right. That's exactly right. Uh, All right. Sean Carney, thank you. CEO, president of 40 Days for Life. Good to talk to you today, sir. I am keeping my eye on... uh, Some news breaking this afternoon. Judge Chutkin has unsealed Jack Smith to remind you the unconstitutionally appointed prosecutor who's going after Donald Trump on behalf of Merrick Garland, who broke the law by assigning Jack Smith to do that in the midst of an election year. Uh, Judge Chutkin has unsealed Jack Smith's 165 page redacted in part. It's got some redactions in it motion regarding the limits of President Trump's presidential immunity. This is uh, the case where they're alleging that Donald Trump tried to steal the election. Uh, And uh, so this 165 page document is coming out right now with uh, just under 40 days to the election. Uh, Remember, the DOJ at one point in some distant past had a, a 60 day rule. We can't do anything to upset the election within 60 days. They don't even care about that crap anymore. The whole effort is an all out assault on Trump and the people who would dare support him. The leading candidate for president of the United States, we're going to try and take him out. Uh, and they're doing it uh, through the way they always do it, which is they spend your money to spread all sorts of innuendo to try and take him down. Remember, the circumstances of the 2020 election, so long as we're going to relitigate them for the six millionth time, is that Donald Trump was raising all sorts of objections. He raised them through the court processes. He raised them in all the variety of the states. And then on January 20th of 2021, he left office. He left. It's it's an obvious acceptance that Joe Biden is coming in. And they saved all these prosecutions for the middle of the 2024 election. They weren't brought in the year after, and they were accelerated in a way that the DOJ doesn't do it for anybody else, only for Trump, only in the midst of an election, only to screw with the election. So the election rigging scheme continues. The ironies here are thick, aren't they? As Trump was concerned about election rigging in 2020, and now the Justice Department is weaponizing its power against Trump to try and stop him from being elected this year. That's the game plan. So some of the details on this filing are coming through, and they're all ridiculous. I saw in one case they referred to 
the 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 infamous Brooks Brothers riot down in Florida back in the year two thousand. Just which is like literally Republican operatives who were just chanting. They said it was a violent event. This is Jack Smith just making things up. An unconstitutional prosecutor taking your money. How many crimes is Jack Smith committing here? Where's that prosecution? Can we unseal that? Stay with us. It turns out the second gentleman has slapped a few women around. That's the latest reporting. At least one. We'll tell you about that. Hey, good afternoon to you. It's 535 here at News Talk 105.9 WMAL, where we're making sense of the news. You can join us, 888-630-9625, 888-630-WMAL. A reminder that uh, Corey and I will be out this week, Friday morning, at the early vote site, Office of Elections in Leesburg, that's Loudoun County, on Miller Drive, 8.30 in the morning, Friday morning. We'll have coffee and donuts provided by Army of Parents. God bless them for helping out. We'll get everybody together. We'll have a great time. Uh, And if you haven't voted yet, if you're a Loudoun County resident, come out and meet us there. Vote there. Otherwise, vote at whatever early voting place you can get to. It's a big election. I want to get everybody out, as many as we can. We'll be out in Loudoun County Friday, 8.30 in the morning. Can't wait to meet you there. For more information, you can go to my Twitter account, my X account. I've got the details pinned to the top. Um, I'm going to get to Doug Emhoff in a moment here. That's the second gentleman, Mr. Kamala, and what he's in the news yet again for today. But before I get there, let's take some calls. I've got Donna and Frederick on line one. Hello, Donna. You are on the Vince Kamala Show. Hi, Vince. You know, I was thinking about the woman splaining, which was basically censorship when she cut off um, J.D. Vance's microphone. I thought that was disgusting. Does that drive you and crazy, I, Donna? Does that drive you crazy? Yeah. When you see that, does it drive you absolutely nuts? Yes, and it, it, it bodes to uh, inform the viewers that they're covering something up, and maybe it does have to do with these illegals and the death of animals, maybe even people, their voodoo practices, God knows, and, and maybe even all of those missing children, and that's why they're hiding things. Yeah, J.D. Vance brought this up, the 300, the 300 or so thousand missing kids in the United States now, and uh, that's all due to Kamala Harris's open border policies. In fact, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because uh, I wanted to emphasize something from that exchange. Um, I don't have the explicit audio in front of me, but I do want to share it with you uh, something that, that my buddy Peter Hassan just shared from the Washington Free Beacon. And here's what it was. Last night, um, you had a moment where J.D. Vance was talking about those missing children. And uh, he said, right now in this country, Margaret, we have 320,000 children that the Department of Homeland Security has effectively lost. Some of them have been sex trafficked. Some of them hopefully are at homes with their families. Some of them have been used as drug trafficking mules. The real family separation policy in this country is unfortunately Kamala Harris's wide open southern border. OK, that's the quote from J.D. Vance. Listen to how Margaret Brennan then turned to Tim Walls. And here's what she said. Governor, do you care to respond to any of this, those specific allegations, including that the vice president is, quote, letting in fentanyl and using kids as drug mules, among other things? J.D. Vance never said that. J.D. Vance said that those the kids have been, in some cases, used as drug mules. He didn't say Kamala Harris was using them as drug mules. Margaret Brennan made up a quote in her fake fact check, Donna. This was an abomination. Oh, it, it really shows you who they are. Again, it's about a bigger, way bigger picture, and they're all part of it. It's, it's almost like they, well, shall I say it? Honestly, it's a criminal syndicate, and it's very big. Remember, it's a big club, and you ain't in it? I'm not well, in that's it. what's going on. It's yeah. massive, though. It's the rigging the, the election. That's, that's it. I mean, they just want to get the Democrats across the finish line. No question uh, about it. Oh, no doubt. And the other thing is J.D. Vance very presidential and it made me feel much more at ease hearing him and how he handled them yesterday should he have to uh, move into that position for yeah. any reason yeah so like they're trying to constantly kill Donald night. Trump that's yeah that's a that's a reason that something like that might happen it's just so awful uh, Donna thank you I, oh, I appreciate Vince. the uh, the call as always very much Donna oh, thank you my but, pleasure of course Mike's in sunshine we'll get to Mike right now line two hello Mike you're on the Vince Colonia show 
Vince, thanks for taking my call. Um, we're now three for three with regard to you know unfairness and bias and uh, different rules within the debates. And I think that maybe Trump was um, told not to uh, complain about the refereeing, but I thought that J.D. Vance did a wonderful job of pushing back. And uh, we just need to um, understand that. I think it was Mal Culpern this morning who said that you know, Republicans in debates, we have to understand that you know, when you walk into a Chinese restaurant, you're going to get Chinese. When you walk into a, a, a network debate, you're going to get bias and unfairness. Yeah. And I think we have to push back. Can, you, can I say one thing? I, mean, I know this is – you're not supposed to draw some sort of uh, optimistic reaction to it, but I, I do have one, Mike, which is I think it makes people better to have to, to be this battle-tested. You know, to go in like like President Trump, I think President Trump is a better politician and a better president for having all of the forces of the left constantly uh, uh, aligned against him. I, I, I just think it improves him. It, it makes it so that he doesn't waste his time. Uh, well, not too much of his time trying to appeal to them, uh, although sometimes he's tempted. Some, he's call, he's still calling Maggie Haberman at The New York Times trying to convince her of whatever. But but for the most part, I think it makes him better, Mike. Uh, but it's not, in the end, very healthy for our country because the left has taken this to lunatic levels. I, I agree that uh, J.D. Vance has been taking fastballs for months. Yeah. And you can see that um, that Mr. Waltz has been taking softballs for months. And that, that you could it see showed. the difference. It showed last night. Yeah, that's, that's the big thing. That's why these lefties, when they're put in these environments where they actually have to have – debates about ideas they collapse under uh, even the thinnest scrutiny uh, and it's due in part to the fact that their ideas are stupid but also because they're not battle tested aoc can't handle this because she never goes into an environment where she has to actually debate these things uh thanks mike i, I appreciate uh, the call and the assessment there let me move to doug emhoff or should i say thug emhoff uh, because we've got uh, a report today from the daily mail that kamala harris's husband doug emhoff in their words forcefully slapped his ex-girlfriend for flirting with another man in a booze-fueled assault after a date to a star-studded gala. So, so Doug Emhoff, the Daily Mail is reporting, is a woman beater. Vice President Kamala Harris's husband assaulted his ex-girlfriend. Three friends have now told DailyMail.com. The second gentleman, Doug Emhoff, 59, allegedly struck the woman in the face so hard that she spun around while waiting in a valet line late at night after a May 2012 uh, uh, Cannes Film Festival event in France. One of her friends told DailyMail.com that the woman called him immediately after the incident, sobbing in her cab, and described the alleged assault. DailyMail.com is not naming a woman who is a successful New York attorney, but will refer to her by the pseudonym Jane. A second friend said that Jane, who had been dating Emhoff for three months, also told her about the alleged violence at the time. A third friend told DailyMail.com that Jane first told her in 2014 that she had dated Emhoff and recounted the full story of his alleged abuse in 2018. That was then when then-Senator Harris was in the news for grilling Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh in a Senate hearing over sexual assault allegations. The friends, who all asked not to be named for fear of retaliation by Emhoff, shared with DailyMail.com pictures of him and Jane together from 2012 and other documents and communications corroborating the elements of the story. Jane declined to comment. The shocking claims follow revelations by the Daily Mail that Emhoff had already cheated on his first wife and mother of his two kids around 2008, allegedly impregnating his daughter's nanny, who also worked as her grade school teacher. Emhoff admitted the affair with the nanny and the teacher, a woman called Nasian Naylor, after DailyMail.com published the story last month. All three of Jane's friends said she also told them about a disturbing alleged incident during her relationship with the second gentleman in which Emhoff nonchalantly admitted to impregnating Naylor. Emhoff told Jane that the nanny accused him of causing her to have a miscarriage. The nanny accused him of causing the miscarriage. How's that? The friends claimed. According to the friends, Emhoff did not say how he was allegedly responsible for the miscarriage, and he told Jane that the nanny's claims were false. But the second gentleman allegedly confessed to Jane that he paid Naylor a settlement of around $80,000 and had the nanny sign a non-disclosure agreement. So a mysterious end to the pregnancy of the nanny uh, who Doug Emhoff had knocked up 
Um, which, by the way, he's admitted to that affair. He was apologetic about it earlier this year that he had this affair. He admitted to that. Uh, additionally, uh, they say that there was a hush money payment to the tune of $80,000 to the nanny. And uh, that when you say hush money, remember the way the left talks about this, it, she had to sign a non-disclosure agreement. It's a hush money payment to the nanny. Don't talk about this. Here's $80,000. And now we get this additional news today that Emhoff had, quote, forcefully slapped an ex-girlfriend for flirting with another man. So uh, the uh, the ex-account and wokeness has run down the series of events here for Doug Emhoff's life. Here's what we know. He, uh, 2009, he impregnated his child's nanny. In 2012, he physically assaults his girlfriend, allegedly. And then starting in 2023... Doug Emhoff began lecturing the rest of us on toxic masculinity and what it means to be a man. Do you remember this interview? Jonathan Capehart, Doug Emhoff talking about, oh, you're so masculine now. You're redefining it. Talk about masculinity for a moment. Um, Has being second gentleman changed your own view of perceived gender roles or what it means to be a man? Whew, that's this is something I've I've thought about a lot and something I've spoken about a lot. There's too much of toxicity, too much. It, it's masculine toxicity out there. And I've gotten some of it out before. We've kind of confused what it means to be a man, what it means to be masculine, where you've got this trope out there that you've got to be tough and yeah. you know angry. And, and, and I was confused by it for years. I would slap women. I just didn't understand what I was supposed to be doing. Lash out to be strong. I just just the opposite. You know, strength is how you show your love for people. Strength is how you are for people and how you have their back and how you, you stick up for other people. Po- this is a Kamala-style answer, by the way. This is becoming tedious. Other people and pushing up, pushing out against bullies. I mean, that's what I believe it is. So every time I can speak against to- this toxicity, I, we're seeing it with our younger people. We're seeing it in our discourse and our politics. In the media, you're seeing it as it relates to so many of the issues that we're, we're pushing back on. So um, I think it's a problem, and I'm going to continue to use this platform every time I get to, to speak out against this toxic masculinity. That's what is this, there. like a scared straight program, an ex-con trying to teach everybody else how not to go down the road that he went down? <laughs> what is that? Uh, I just, I'm here to reshape masculinity, he says. Now he's credibly accused of having slapped a woman so hard that she spun around. Jen Psaki was uh, fluffing up. Uh, old Mr. Kamala this past weekend as being very masculine. Something that has all you've also that has also been an important part or an interesting part of how people have talked about your role here is how your role has reshaped the perception of masculinity. Oh, and I'm not sure you planned on that, but you are a incredibly supportive spouse. You know, it, it was funny. What's crazy about this? Like the left's whole plan is redefining masculinity. Like the idea of man being a category is being erased by the left. Oh, look at you, redefining masculinity. Well, that's the whole plan. The left is doing that for everybody. They're redefining femininity. They're redefining masculinity. They're trying to make everybody into an, an androgynous mess, that you're, you're not in any way human. You're just a muddy mess with, with no measurable qualities whatsoever, and you serve the state. Has that been an evolution for you, and do you think that's part of the role you might play uh, as first gentleman? It's funny. I've, I've started to think a lot about this. I've always been like... Uh, he did an interview well over a year ago where uh, he said to Jonathan Capehart, I just played for you, that he's been thinking a lot about this. And now he's saying, I just suddenly started thinking a lot about this. So even that's a lot. This, my dad was like this. And uh, to me, it's the right thing to do. You know, support women. Uh, it, it's mutual. Like with Kamala and I, it's, we support each other. We have each other's back. And I've said many times when we lift up women we support women whether it's pay equity child care family leave and a good slap to the face all these issues that and you know this post Dobbs hellscape um women should not be less than women should not have less rights and be treated differently that's not the american way and it's also not- no, i treat them the same way i treat men open hand slaps not like if some woman succeeds, some dude out there is suffering, it's not a one-to-one relationship. When we lift up women, we lift up families, we lift up the economy. And when She practically left her feet when I, I was in the business world. It lifted up 
the organizations that I was in. It certainly lifted up the White House uh, when you were there with you there and Kamala as, as vice president. And you were there and you were there? It was a great workplace there. There's a pop culture phrase, wife guy, which you've kind of been known as. Are you familiar with this? I've heard about it. As called a wife guy, a proud wife guy. <laughs> How do you feel about that? Well, if I do something annoying to Kamala and she gets upset, I'll just show her that article. Right. And I'll say, I'm right. trying. Or a t-shirt or a mug. Yeah. Uh, everybody just threw up in studio. We all just threw up together. That was, I'm a wife guy, he said. He's the wife guy. Uh-huh. Um, he, uh, did he go to the Sean Connery School of Handling Women? Are you familiar with the, uh, the old Sean Connery clip? Barbara Walters interviewed him years ago. And said, is it true that you say it's okay from time to time to slap a woman? And uh, Sean Connery, he stuck to his guns. You think it's good to slap a woman? No, I don't think it's good. I think, think it's bad. It must, I don't think it's that bad. I think that it depends entirely on the circumstances and if it merits it. Yeah. Well, what would merit it? Well, if you have tried everything else, and women are pretty good at this. If, you, they, they can't, if you've tried everything else, if, if you've, you've done everything possible. And leave it alone. Yeah. They don't they want to have the, the, the last word, and you give them the last, last word, but they're not happy with the last word. They want to say it again and, and get into a really provocative situation. Then I think it's absolutely right. To give her a good slap? Yeah, absolutely. What if she gives you a good slap back? Well, then you get into another area. I mean, uh, then maybe she's getting to like it, and then it becomes something else. I don't know. But uh, this guy is unbelievable. Uh, no, no. I, seriously, I think that uh, it's the last resort. He's not going to do it because he wants to do it. Huh? Wait till people see this interview. Are you going to get mail? Might get some female. <laughs> <laughs> Did he really say I might get some female at the end of that? Sean Connery. Um, Doug Emhoff does not have that delivery, by the way. But he, he apparently uh, uh, heeded Sean Connery's words. He's like, you know, Sean had a point. Doug Emhoff must have concluded. And he's uh, slapping up women. And uh, the Daily Mail. How does the Daily Mail keep getting this stuff? What what sources did they have? They end up, that's Now that's two for two on Doug Emhoff. They found out about him knocking up the nanny and knocking out his date. That's... What is the Daily Mail going to tell us next? I think Tim Walls is lying again. Here he is on a campaign stage today. I'm a hunter, and I found out in the first debate, Kamala's a hunter. What? Kamala's a hunter? Oh, do tell. I want to find out more about this. I don't expect any CBS fact checks on this, but, boy, I really wish they would dig in. Again, join us in Loudoun, Loudoun County. That's Friday morning, 8.30. Coffees and donuts and lots of votes. That's the Office of Elections in Leesburg. Up next, my good buddy, Larry O'Connor in for the great one, Mark Levin, here on WMAL.